memorable ones I sent to you. No, oh, this is one where it's like, I forgot the password. Okay. And it was really heavy.
typical of me, I have no filter, and I start saying whatever comes to my mind, and I remember distinctly, this is a random story, but I remember thinking and saying this out loud to this group of very like socially ebbed people, like, what if we got to the bottom, and Provo had been overtaken by the Cuban army, <laughs> and they made us um, hike back up to the top, would you be able to do it? And I distinctly remember a few people in the group look at each other and just like <laughs> make a face like, who is this person? And they're like, cut me to the core. That's okay, I was, I was okay. I had enough endorphins to get me through that. Um, and that night, I was found a hub evening. And I was starving because I hadn't eaten very much about a hike. You burned so many calories hiking up that. We get back and FHE starts, and of course it's like at BYU Creamery loves to do this. Probably like 15 buckets, like three gallon buckets of ice cream. And I was, my body was screaming for food. And so instead of going up and getting some food before coming back down, I ended up just eating a lot of ice cream. I was starving, so I ate and ate and ate ice cream. And then suddenly I just had this thought. What if I just threw it up? And it was like the most exciting thought I've ever had. It's very hard to explain. It's very hard to explain in words. So that's what I did. I went upstairs and I threw up for the first time. Wandering around and, and 
really can't hurt it. That's kind of my life. So my dad set up a weekly therapy appointments with a man named Paul at the Center for Change. And sure enough, I went once a week for about a month, and then finally he said, hey, you just need to come in. You're not well. And um, my parents made a lot of sacrifices to get me there. And so I found out I was going in in three weeks, and I dropped out of BYU. Um, it was my technically my senior year, credit-wise, and thus passed the, like, the last desperate days before going to treatment. And I was trying to get all the bulimia out of my system before I went in because when I went to treatment, I would be cured because at that point, my, my thinking was still so rigid that I thought, you go into treatment and you're cured. Um, and I didn't think about the complexity of recovery and the nuances of recovery and how it would be a lifelong struggle, um, and it still is to this day. Uh, and so I had to inform also a lot of people that I was dropping out of school. I had to tell my bishop. Um, I was humiliated to tell people, my roommates, and they were like, oh, that's why my food would go missing. Like, yeah, it's, it's humiliating. I had to tell my professors, I had to tell my marching band director, um, because there was a concert in a few weeks and my position was really important for the band. And it was, he was very shocked and disappointed. And I felt like I had let a lot of people down, but most of all, I missed my best friend. I missed my, my secret, because it was out now. So, on October 25th, 2004, I signed my life away at the Center for Change. It was the best decision I've ever made. And after my sister and I said our goodbyes, things got real, really fast. Uh, there was a strip search. That was not very fun. They searched all of my luggage for anything, um, what's the word, things that are considered dangerous or harmful. Contraband. What is it? Contraband. Contra contraband, thank you. They took away the bobby pins that I just bought so annoyed. They took all the shoelaces off my shoes, they removed the drawstring from all my pants, and the medical intake was <clears throat> equally petrifying. The nurse couldn't find my vein, and she looked at me and said, are you, are you dehydrated lately? And I just, I knew what was coming next, and she said, have you been purging lately? I was like, uh, yes. And I was too ashamed to look her in eyes, I just looked down, as if she had never met a bulimic person before working at an aim disorder clinic. Um, I don't remember the, the much about the first day, the rest of the first day. I remember that we had artichoke dip for one of the snacks. It was good. The portion was pre-measured, and it was a lot smaller than I was used to eating. Uh, I didn't talk to many people that day. I was trying to be brave, and I was trying to take things in like an academic. Like, I can't wait to tell my friends and family about this bizarre experience. Um, this bizarre world that I was now a citizen of. For example, you can't flush your own toilet, because everything has to be reported by the care techs. Um, the number of glasses of water you drink is recorded. You reach for the water and a care tech is like, um, you can't shave because there's no razors allowed, obviously, and bless the overnight care, te care techs, every 30 minutes they had to do bed checks. They would come in from the bedroom door and shine a light right to your face. Um, and one of my roommates would do sit-ups in between, and uh, I didn't tell on her because I felt bad. So, um, Oh, to make sure that we wouldn't go AWOL. One girl did go AWOL, actually. She's kind of a legend. She came back two hours later, knocked on the front door, and had a can of Diet Coke in her hand. It's like, can I come back? <laughs> Still remember that. Another daily routine was the morning weigh-in. At 5.45, they woke us up. We had to put on this medical gown. Um, and we'd all line up, bleary-eyed, grumpy, annoyed at some of the really chipper girls like the excited and like happy girls, a lot of them still had feeding tubes and they weren't quite there yet because they were just, they'd been anorexic for so long that they kind of lost their minds and they were like, for some reason, very excitable and very happy all the time. So they were probably still used to hiding the fact that they had an eating disorder. It was like, girl, we know, we know, just, just be grumpy, please. At my first weigh-in, I was horrified. I stepped on the scale. I didn't see the numbers. The numbers showed to a care tech across the room. I didn't have my glasses on, but when I looked up, I could kind of see one of my really, really good friends who I had worked with on an on-campus job. And I was just so embarrassed. And she recognized me, so I'm like, hey, Sarah. She's like, hey, Haley. How are you? I'm like, not very good. 
um, and just, just so much shame and embarrassment. But I started falling in easily with a routine and even the lingo. Every day we had art therapy, music therapy, dance therapy, experiential, I still can't say it, therapy, group therapy, personal therapy, dietetics, things like that. The lingo was very unique. You had the food solo, the food challenge, phase one through phase four, inpatient, residential, family style, intuitive eating. A group of us even wrote a dictionary for all of the terms, and you don't want to know the definition for healthy. Uh, we got in trouble for that one. Then there were the most important terms that I learned from my therapist, Kim Crossley, who I credit for saving my life, basically. Distorted thinking, all or nothing, mind reading, dust of the earth, center of the universe. When you think that you have this power to destroy people, you know, to destroy people's good days by being grumpy or things like that. Self-love, flexible thinking, Tomorrow's a new day. How's that working for you? All these things that I hadn't really considered before because I was in the fog of bulimia. Treatment for me and treatment for anyone with a pernicious eating disorder is absolutely essential. It helped clear the fog of my emotions, of what I didn't even know was going through my head. It helped me understand what was going on helped me look back and see some of the things that had led to it. Now, people will ask me, why did you have an eating disorder? And it's, it's hard to explain why, because every case is different. But what I can tell you an eating disorder is not, it's not just about control, because a lot of people will be like, yeah, it's all about control. That's kind of the textbook definition of it if you talk to a lay person who may not know very much about it. It's not a first world problem. A lot of the refugees I work with having disorders and cut because of the trauma they've experienced. And it's not gluttony. Just like Kim Crossley, my therapist, said, fat is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. Like, how are you feeling today? I feel fat today. It's not a feeling. It's a secondary feeling to what is going on. So we spent session after session exploring why I was bulimic, why I was doing this. And for me, Personally, it was just a combination of all kinds of things. It was little T traumas, big T traumas, um, undiagnosed mental illness. It's just a, a mixed bag of all kinds of things. If you ask any person with eating disorder, it'll be a different bag of things. <laughs> and treatment was amazing. I, sometimes I wish I could make a movie about it. Because you take girls and women from age 13 to 65, put them in this kind of control environment together, and you strip away any kind of expectation from the outside world. Literally, you can't even like, we didn't have phones, we had no access to the outside world. It was just self-love, self-love, self-love. And because of that, we acted like crazy people. We had no inhibitions, and I just remember some of the most endearing stories. One of the girls, Lorena, she, she hadn't gotten her period for a long time because she was anorexic. And, um, finally, she got her period, and I remember her standing on stool one day. She just got on stool like, I'm starting my period! And we all just clapped and burst out laughing. <laughs> there were um, just some moments in like uh, dance therapy we would have to act like lobsters and, and crawl around. And I think outside, in, in a not-so-controlled environment, I'd be like, I can't do this, I'm too self-conscious. But it was just so much joy. So much joy. It was like being a child again. And it was just so much love. We loved each other and we supported each other. And um, when I got out, it was back to um, back to school, back to these social events where people seem to know what to talk about. They stand in circles around food and they laugh, and you're like, you join the circle, and you're like, ah, you just don't know what to say. And where have you been the last four months? Um, what else? Just my testimony definitely took a hit as well. I mean, isolation from people is one thing, but isolation from deity is another. So I'd go to church and feel like a fraud. 
Um, I, I don't know if it's probably how RMs feel, where you can come back and you just feel like you don't fit in because you've had this massive experience that changed your life and you just don't know how to fit in. It's kind of like that. Um, there, were good, there were good things. I didn't immediately fall back into believing in self-harm. Uh, in fact, one of the things that kind of really helped me a lot was just one thing, and that was accountability to my therapist. I still saw her once a week. And she knew that I loved skiing. Um, I hadn't broken my ankle skiing like I did months ago. And she said, well, if you've heard, if you've been hurt this week, you can't go skiing. And I had a really cheap um, student pass, really awesome. So that got me through the winter, basically. I, I wanted to go skiing, this was just fun, and it means I could kind of dish class on Friday and go. And I just listen to music and just ski around and just feel happy and free. Um, but when that ended, when that season ended and things just kept going, I, I started falling back into it every once in a while. Oh, I overeat. I know how to do something about that. No, don't do it. <sighs> so it'd be this back and forth, kind of two angels, an angel and a devil on my shoulder. And every once in a while I would give in. And it would feel so good, and then it would feel so bad, because, you know, like, oh, my parents spent this much to get me to treatment. Um, and I, I, I knew better. I knew better. Because I had this arsenal of self-care and self-love um, strategies, like, go read a book, or talk to a friend or call a family member you have. I had lots of friends. Um, my roommates were amazing and very supportive. There's no excuse at this point. But it started, fall I started falling back. I was also struggling socially, um, some codependency with some people. I couldn't quite live for myself yet, so a lot of my emotions depended on other people. It just wasn't super stable. It's a very, it's like a pressure cooker here sometimes. So one day, um, I decided either, it was, a, it was a dark day. I remember very clearly one of my good friends that I depended, depended on greatly was dating someone seriously, which means I was a little more, didn't have her attention. And so I was feeling very low on it. So it was either I cut or, or I binge encourage or I do something that Kim taught me to do. And so I went to the public library in Provo and I was like, I'm gonna learn a foreign language or foreign alphabet. That's what I'm gonna do today. I don't need to learn the language. I'm going to learn the alphabet, and I can go home and feel like I've done something productive and done something healthy, and I won't have that horrible feeling of, I know better and I shouldn't have done that. So I picked out a book, and it was a book called Alif Ba, the Arabic sounds and letters. And I opened it up, and it was like this magic feeling that I haven't experienced before. It's probably like falling in love. I don't know what that's like. But it was electric. Um, and it was definitely the spirit telling me to pursue it. At least to sit down and learn the alphabet. And so I did that. I sat down in the Provo Library for like two hours, and I went through and I kind of learned how to scribble out Arabic. And I was like, wow, this is actually kind of easy. And then I rented the book, and I took it home, and then I spent the next two weeks over Christmas vacation learning the Arabic alphabet. And I got more and more and more obsessed with it. And I remember, um, I was home for Christmas, and I was just in love with Arabic. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And uh, I remember eating some, I was at a restaurant with my family, and my dad, he said, well, well, I told him I, I'm going to major, I'm not major, I'm going to take an Arabic class next semester. I'm graduating next semester, but I'm going to take it. And he said, why would, why are you, no, don't do that. It doesn't make any sense. My dad's very logical, very practical, and I'm not. So I was like, that's probably true. It's not very practical. I'm almost about to graduate in English. I have no idea what I'm doing, but okay, I'll, I'll drop it. So I dropped the class, and it's fine. And then one day, I worked at the printing press here at BYU. One day, we were printing a big book. I was just putting these massive stacks of paper into the machine. And that book was the Arabic Book of Mormon. And I was like, I love this, this scribbles. Like, I have to know, I have to know how to read this. And so I signed up for Arabic again. 8 o'clock a.m. class, which means something. And I started learning Arabic, and it just made me feel so, so, so good. And it gave me purpose. It, I had to study two hours a day for Arabic 101. For the first, like, three days, I was like, I don't need to study. I already learned the alphabet, and then after three days, they moved on. I'm like, ooh, okay, ooh, I do need to study. And then, sure enough, I, you know, Arabic is one of those languages that is, you think it's really, you think you're a genius, because it's kind of easy at first. You're like, everyone's like, those scribbles are so hard. And you're like, 
actually kind of kind of easy. So I'm really smart. And then you get sucked in, and you realize, oh my gosh, this is so hard. There are like 64 dialects. You go to one country, you have no idea what they're saying. But I didn't know that. So I decided I'm going to stay, and I'm going to minor in Arabic. The reactions were mixed. People were like, what are you doing? Why? And, and I didn't want to tell people it's because it's, it's either this or I don't know. And so that became kind of, the, that, that's what helped me through. And it gave me purpose again. I ended up studying abroad in Morocco for a semester, and that was great. I met amazing people. It opened my eyes to an in, incredible culture and hospitality and generosity that you'll, you'll never, it's unmatched. Um, and it put me on a, an interesting path, and it put me on a path that didn't make sense. I got a master's, but I spent most of my time traveling and not really studying. I could barely passed my master's. People are like, wow, you have a master's in London? I'm like, yeah, I traveled to other countries. I don't remember anything in there. Um, there were some dark, dark, dark times. Very dark. So I think from the outside, people would say, wow, Haley, you're just so successful. You're learning Arabic, you speak Arabic, you're getting a master's. And I'm just like, all I'm doing is surviving. I'm surviving. And that became kind of the motto of my life. So I ended up like, just again, kind of, um, my life that looked like it had a lot of purpose. Um, I ended up teaching ESL in Boston to adults. And then I got a job in Poland that I turned down. And I just didn't know what to do. And so I ended up as a substitute teacher at this like completely dysfunctional middle school in inner city Boston. I was there for two years, kind of just, I was what you call a cluster sub, which means I showed up and did whatever they needed me to do that day for two years. Um, I didn't speak Arabic for two years. And it looked like I wasn't doing anything with my life. Um, it didn't look like I was going anywhere. I didn't have a trajectory. But to me, I was surviving. And that was enough. I wasn't hurting myself, and some days that was enough. Um, and then I got a job teaching Arabic at a high school in Boston. And so I realized, wow, Heavenly Father really did have this little plan. It ended up being kind of my dream job. I loved it. It was also really hard. Um, I was teaching several levels a day, and there's no curriculum. You can't adapt a college curriculum. High school kids don't care about the UN. They're not going to want to learn how to say, I want to travel to the UN as an ambassador. So you have to go home every day and you have to rewrite curriculum that high school students love. It's very draining and very overwhelming. I probably wasn't the best teacher. I was, my emotions are a little bit all over the place. Some days I'd be like, I don't want to be here and my, my kids would know that. Some days I'd be like super hyper and we'd be doing like crazy activities gingerbread mosques, things like that. But it was fun, and they were wonderful. I loved them, they loved me, it was a really good experience. And, um, and then I had that feeling like, you know what, I think I need to be done. The next year they were adding another level, and uh, they didn't get funding for another teacher, so it was like, oof. So I made that move. See what I did, I'm back at the beginning where I started? Yeah. So I made that move to Arizona, it was very difficult. But after Greece, I started at Lifting Hands International, and it was going to be small. It was going to be very, very small. And thanks to General Conference and kind of the attention that the church and, and church members all of a sudden had this awareness about the refugee crisis, thanks to General Conference and the um, I Was a Stranger movement, we were able to grow pretty quickly, and I was able to quit my job, and all of a sudden I was an executive director of a nonprofit. I had no idea what to do. But I just did it. I went abroad. I used my Arabic as well as I could. I talked to people. I really, really understood where they were coming from because I could talk to them directly in their language. And it's so funny looking back because all these random skills I had, I've been able to put together and to use. And a lot of that came from surviving. A lot of the skills I was able to get came from surviving. Learning Arabic came from surviving, because I was having such a hard time. And it has been an incredible experience. But again, I'm not going to go too much into that. But what I want to really emphasize is how Heavenly Father loves every single person. 
every single person, and we have each very individual trials. We've been given, we've been given individual trials to make us who we are. Sorry, I'm just thinking about some people, and it's, I don't want to cry, so just give me a second. And now, in our center, we have a refugee center in Greece, in northern Greece. We have 450 uh, refugees in, in the camp. We don't run the camp, but we run a refugee center close to the camp. And it has three, uh, three large structures on some farmland that we've rented. So we've had this center for about a year and a half. We provide all kinds of services. We have a full-time team of volunteers there. We have a women's center where we teach them trauma-informed yoga. Teach them English, German. We have a few volunteers here who have been there. And it's incredible because so many women come to the center with scars on their arms. Or you can see that they're dropping weight, and that they refuse to eat. And they've had big T traumas in their lives. This particular population is from Iraq, northern Iraq, and they're called Yazidis. So they're not Muslim, they're not Christian, they're this ethnic, religious minority. And ISIS um, invaded their area in um, 2014. They were forced to flee, and many of them died when they fled. Thousands were kidnapped and sold into sexual, sexual slavery. Thousands of men were executed. So a lot of the ways these women um, are able to cope sitting day after day in this camp in Greece. The borders have been shut, so they can't just leave. They have to wait until a country accepts them, and it's going to be a long time. They suffer, and they struggle with these memories. And it's just interesting how sometimes they act. They act out. They cut. They throw up. They starve themselves. There's other things, too. But eating disorders, it's a universal sign that there is something else going on. Another point I want to emphasize, again, is that that is where God's love is manifested. His day-to-day -day relationships and things like that. And even in the refugee world, that's how we make a difference, is by the day-to-day -day interactions with them. Not the overarching saving people and things like that. That's not how it works. There are so many things everyone can do. And the most important thing is that you don't have to be a refugee to, have to, be, to need help. You don't have to be living in poverty. You don't have to be fleeing from a country for your life to need help. And that is so hard. That's something I struggle with. And I'm actually really grateful I broke my ankle because I've had to be home for several months. And I've had to go back to therapy. Because all I can think about is how much my suffering doesn't matter anymore. That's not true. Because I just struggle. We all do. And I struggle with a lot more than I thought I did. So it's been a miracle to have someone I don't know if he like broke my ankle for me. Hopefully not. But it's been very nice to have this chance to think, to sit back and be like, I have, I need to heal. I'm not all better. I consider myself recovered from bulimia. But the process of recovery is not a destination. You don't just, I'm better. It's, it's not how it works. I still struggle with body image. I still struggle with negative thoughts, pernicious. I think a lot of us do. I still wake up every day and think, I don't, I'm not worth anything. Don't be all. The one difference is that I've learned how to control the, the impulse to, to hurt myself. And that's okay. If I don't ever get to the point where I'm totally like, I'm fine, that's fine, that's okay. Does it affect my life? Sure. Does it affect my ability to have relationships? Probably. Does 
it make me hate the mutual app? Absolutely. <laughs> I've deleted it like three times. <laughs> but if you need help, get help. Will you end up running a nonprofit? Don't. <laughs> it's really hard. Maybe not. Will you end up getting married? Who knows? Will you end up successful with a great paying job? Who knows? Who cares? Get better. Because when you're better, you'll be able to help others. You can do it. Use me as an example if you need to. Use that employee at McDonald's the other day who smiled at me. I'm not kidding. I went to, diet to McDonald's before church to get a Diet Coke so I would stay away. I was feeling horrible. And he smiled at me. This little teenage boy with acne was like, did you break your ankle? Are you a skater? I'm like, no. But it like made my day. It changed me. Even though I was breaking the Sabbath and drinking caffeine, I think that's exactly what I needed. Be that person that someone needs. But at the same time, You can't lose yourself in service if you're already lost. That's something we don't think about enough. I've heard so many people say, if I could only, I just, I need to help people, but I feel so bad. Well, find yourself first. It's okay, give yourself some time. Be patient with yourself. Find what works. For me, Arabic works. It was something I loved and was passionate about. For some of you, it might be watching Netflix, I don't know. Find something that works and makes you feel okay, makes you feel happy, distracts you from what's going on. Get help. Get professional help. I just worry so much that some of you will walk out of here and feel like they can't do it, that they suck. They can't do what I've done. So, guys, I graduated. This, this all happened like years and years ago. And it's been an incredibly difficult trip for me. This is just life. Life is hard. So one last thought to leave you before I end is something my therapist shared with me. I really struggle with all or nothing still. If I'm not totally perfect or if I'm not totally great at this, then I'm terrible. And there's all kinds of things that I really struggle with. Like, I wish my Arabic were better. I wish this, I wish that. And she said, Haley, you have a whole lifetime to learn, or you have a whole lifetime to get better at these things. Have a whole lifetime to learn Arabic. You don't have to learn it all in one day. And then she said, You have immortality to learn. You have an entire life plus eternity to perfect yourselves. Be gentle with yourself, Amy. And it reminded me, you're right. What a gift we've been given. We've been given an entire life and immortality. Christ.